My name is Trudy Logan and I'm the founder and CEO of Arrhythmia Alliance. Arrhythmia Alliance is a collaboration of patients, caregivers, healthcare professionals and policymakers. And we want to bring to you today education so you can better understand living with arrhythmias. I'm delighted to welcome Professor Hugh Colkins, Medical Director of Arrhythmia Alliance. Uh, Professor Colkins is based at John Hopkins in Baltimore. Welcome Professor Colkins, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Julie. It's good to be here. Thank you. Um, I have a variety of questions for you from our panel. Uh, a lot of them very worried, very anxious. So if we could just go through them, and I know your expertise will be invaluable in reassuring uh, the patients. The first question I'm going to ask about devices. What is the difference between an ICD, an SICD, and a pacemaker? So let's start with a pacemaker. A pacemaker is a fairly simple device. It was developed initially in the 1960s, but it's a device that keeps your heart rate, it prevents your heart from going too slow. So there's a small generator, a small, uh, about the size of a 25 cent piece or something like that, or a small, a small can that's put under your, in your subclavian region. And then there's one or two wires that get thread down into your heart and it paces your heart. And its purpose is to keep your heart from going too slowly. Uh, you know, your heart rate normally should vary from, we'll say 60 when you're resting to 150 when you're exercising. Some people develop a condition like heart block where impulses can't get from the upper to the lower chamber. And then their heart stops or it goes 10 beats a minute and they get lightheaded or dizzy. So those are the types of patients that could benefit from a pacemaker. But it's a very common device. They've been around for decades. They're extremely reliable, extremely straightforward to put in, either on an outpatient basis or you spend one night in the hospital. So that's a pacemaker. Now, a defibrillator is like a pacemaker in the sense it's put in the same way. You, you make a little incision under the collarbone, under the skin. You thread one or two wires into the heart. The wires are a little bit thicker. But a defibrillator not only treats slow heart rhythms like a pacemaker, but it also treats fast heart rhythms, something called ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. If you get a runaway heartbeat where your heart's going over 180 or 200 beats a minute, a defibrillator will either try to stop that runaway heartbeat by putting in extra beats, pacing your heart very, very quickly, or it gives you a shock or jolt to get you back to normal rhythm. So a defibrillator is both for slow heart rhythms, but it's really put in to prevent sudden cardiac death or sustained VT, these runaway lower chamber rhythms that we see in patients that have underlying types of heart disease. Now, the third uh, question, part of the question was an SICD. An SICD is a subcutaneous ICD. So it's a defibrillator that's designed to prevent sudden death and treat rapid VT and it does so by giving a shock, but the device is totally outside the thoracic cage, so it's under the skin, but it's not inside your heart. You don't thread it through veins into the heart. There's a generator that's put in your axilla under the skin in your armpit, if you will. There's one wire that gets run along your sternum under the skin, and it will give a jolt between those two. Now, an SICD, is a not, it doesn't function as a pacemaker, so it's just designed to treat the fast heart rhythms. Thank you, that's good. Next question, is remote monitoring the same as home monitoring? Uh, I think those terms can be used interchangeably. I mean, the technology has evolved over the time. In the old days, patients could have their pacemakers checked at home with a a, a sort of a interchange that went over standard phone lines. And this has all evolved now where pacemakers and defibrillators are hooked to a base station in your home that links to the cloud. And then that cloud is also linked to the hospital that's assigned to monitor your device. So if your defibrillator goes off, you know, your remote, through the remote monitoring station, they'll know about it, they'll be able to contact you or if there's a problem with your pacemaker, 
and also a lot of the routine follow-up for pacemakers and defibrillators. You know, usually in the old days, you'd have to come in every three months or every six months and have the device checked, the battery, the wires. Now all this can be done with remote monitoring or, or, you know, or home monitoring. I would think those terms are somewhat interchangeable and they both make life more convenient for the patients, but they've also been shown to improve outcomes. You know, by getting the doctor and the patient connected quicker, if there's a fault with the system, if you have an arrhythmia, it actually has been shown to improve patient care. So this is really the, the way of the future is more and more remote monitoring. <clears throat> and that's even before the days of COVID. Now with COVID, we don't want anyone in the hospitals if at all possible. So this remote monitoring is becoming all the more important. Certainly the patients that we hear from that have got the remote monitors, they, they feel so much better. They feel as though they have the doctor at home with them. Um, that they know that they will be contacted if there is anything. And so, yeah, patients actually welcome remote monitoring. Uh, a patient has heard of catheter ablation for AF, but what other ablations are there and for what conditions? Well, most cardiac arrhythmias can be treated with catheter ablation. And if we think about how catheter ablation developed, the first arrhythmia to be treated or the first target for ablation was the AV node. If someone has AFib with runaway heartbeats and you can't treat the AFib, can't cure the AFib with catheter ablation, you can do a palliative procedure where you zap the connection between the upper and lower chamber, put in a pacemaker, and that prevents the, the AFib from causing that patient to go 200 beats a minute or so forth. So that's an AV node ablation that was developed in the early 1980s. It's been around for a long time. It's a very simple, straightforward procedure, generally performed in elderly patients. Now, the second arrhythmia, the second and third arrhythmia that, 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 that the technology was developed for was, some, was for treatment of PSVT and WPW syndrome. So PSVT is a runaway heartbeat that young people get, either kids or young adults or middle-aged adults, really could happen at any, any age. And it's like AFib where your heart goes very, very fast, but it's different from AFib because it's due to a short circuit in the heart and a runaway heartbeat where the heart will suddenly go 200, 220 beats a minute, and it's dead on regular. It's, it's like a, a, a runaway pacemaker, you know, you're going along beat, 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 all of a sudden, beat, 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 and unlike AFib, which is irregular, beat, 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 you know, PSVT is beat, 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 it's like a metronome, a very fast metronome, and PSVT is caused by an extra connection either in the middle of the heart called AV node reentry, or an extra muscle fiber connecting the upper and lower chamber called an accessory pathway or WPW syndrome. And, and these types of catheter ablation procedures were developed in the late 80s and early 90s. And they're now the standard of care. They're 98% or greater curative. The success rate is fantastic. And unlike AFib ablation, which is palliative, it doesn't last forever in all patients. For PSVT, you do the procedures in outpatient, it's curative, that patient will never suffer that arrhythmia again. And the complications are almost unheard of, less than one in 300 patients has a complication. They come in as an outpatient, have the procedure. So this is a very mature type of ablation procedure that's been around for decades. There's nothing new, there's nothing exciting, we can't make it any better. Now the third, the fourth arrhythmia where catheter ablation was developed was for atrial flutter. Atrial flutter is like AFib, it's sort of in between PSVT and AFib. Like PSVT, it's regular. Your heart goes beep, 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 beep. You know, it's a regular rhythm, but it's due to a single short circuit in the upper chamber, where the upper chamber short circuit goes 300 beats a minute. The heart lower chamber goes 150 beats a minute, and that's called atrial flutter. And again, catheter ablation for atrial flutter was developed in the early to mid 90s. And it too is now virtually successful in 100% of patients with a complication rate of one in less than one in 300. So again, an outpatient procedure, first line treatment, simple, safe, nothing's gonna improve with ablation of atrial flutter. And then you come to 
ventricular arrhythmias. For ventricular arrhythmias, you have something called idiopathic VT or idiopathic PVCs. Extra beats or runaway heartbeats from the lower chamber that occurs in someone with a structurally normal heart. It's just an electrical problem. For that condition, you can thread a catheter up and zap that little runaway focus. Again, 95% successful, virtually no complications, first line therapy, been around for a long time. Then you have VT in patients that have diseased hearts, cardiomyopathy, heart attack, ARVD, cardiac sarcoidosis. That's a much more complex arrhythmia. It's more like a fib, if you will, where we don't fully understand all of the circuits. You know, there's an underlying progressive condition. So catheter ablation is also used to treat VT in these patients, but the success rate is really only about 50% and the complication rates three to four to 5%. So it's more of a second line procedure. And then we have a fib ablation, which again has come a long way. Now it's, it's either first or second line, but the you know, efficacy in a good candidate is about 70%. Complications about 1% in experienced hands. So, catheter ablation is a very exciting field. You know, I was lucky to be involved in the very early days of catheter ablation, and it's been fun seeing it evolve in such a wonderful way. And it can make such a difference to patients living with the various arrhythmias, and it can almost restore them back to just active lives for some of them, isn't it? Well, for, particularly for PSVT and atrial flutter, where it's literally curative, you can say, you're cured, you know, have a nice life kind of thing. You don't have to see me anymore. That's different than, than you know, BT in someone with a diseased heart or AFib where, you know, five years later, the AFib may come back. You know, we're fighting Father Time. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly for some patients, it is. It's fantastic. So thank you, Professor Calkins, on behalf of the Alliance and all our patients for providing this valuable information. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Trudy. Take care.